Good morning, everyone. How is everybody? Happy Easter. Is this still Easter? We can still say that, right? How many of you were able to be here for um, the talk on Wednesday night from uh, Adriana Akutis, okay, uh, on Divine Mercy, the Divine Mercy image? And so, uh, for those of you that did not get to see that, the video will be posted today. It will be on our YouTube page, so uh, you should be able to, to catch that. I highly encourage you to go watch that uh, if you were not able to be here. She has a very inspiring message. Uh, that is underneath all the work that she's done on that particular image. So highly encourage you to do that. With a to, little humor. With a little bit of humor, yes. So um, today, what we're going to do is actually um, begin the period that's called mystagogy. This is for our neophytes. We tend to think of it as being for neophytes. Those people who just received their initiation sacraments or just came into the church were received into the church at Easter Vigil. But it's really for all of us. As Father Rainey mentioned at the at the early Mass, uh, we're all neophytes in some respect. I, I think I always will be on some level, always learning. But um, this is a specific period that's set aside in the life of the church to um, for those who, who just entered the church to begin to explore the mysteries of the sacraments that they received at Easter. And since we are an Easter people, we're all Easter people, and we all can probably recall our First Holy Communions or our confirmations, I have the gift, as I know some of, uh, some of the, the neophytes did, of remembering my baptism. Uh, I was 18 when I was baptized, so I have, I have a great memory of that. And as a matter of fact, I was thinking about this. Every time I do a talk like this about mystagogy, uh, the beginning of mystagogy, I, I always think of it as a great gift to me. And you've heard, some of you may have heard me say this before, that um, I'm always grateful whenever I get to talk about um, or, or have the opportunity to reflect upon my own journey uh, into the church. Uh, one of the benefits of my own very early Catholic formation and experience with mystagogy is that I recognize gifts when I receive them. And this is, this is a gift to be able to do that. Uh, I was able to, getting ready to, to, to prepare for this and formulating my thoughts about it and organizing this gave me an opportunity to reflect uh, on some wonderful memories of my own journey and a very special person and time in my life. Uh, those many, many years ago. So yes, being, being uh, able to do this is a real gift. So the word mystagogy literally means uh, to lead into mystery. To lead into mystery. That which has yet to be revealed. So those of you that are neophytes, this is that opportunity to sort of to be led into the mystery of the sacraments that you just received. The beginning of that. It's a lifelong process. And we think about it in the terms of the, of the liturgical and catechetical life of the church. We tend to think of this as being five or six weeks, but actually mystagogy, when you think about what it really means to be led into the mystery, that's a lifelong process. That's something we're always going to be doing. Um, it's a process that opens the door for us to kind of a deeper, uh, a deeper conversion, always a deeper conversion. Encountering God is encountering mystery because he dwells, remember as we say, in light and accessible on St. Paul tells us that. But because God created us to know him, created us to know him, that mystery is experienced in so many different ways. And I think if, if I did nothing else for the neophytes, it would be to tell you this, that mystery is experienced in nature, it's experienced in our senses, it's experienced through our human interactions, uh, our relationships, and most profoundly, of course, through the church, uh, through an ongoing sacramental encounter with the church. In the early church, certainly by the time of St. Ambrose uh, and St. John uh, Chrysostom in the, in the fourth century, as soon as Christians came out of the waters of baptism, as soon as they would literally come out of the waters of baptism and receive the Eucharist for the first time, they entered a very specific period, an intense period, far more intense than this. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. A very intense period of listening to others, teachers, 
uh, primarily, but others who could help them explore more fully the mysteries they had just experienced. Imagine having done your OCIA with the Bishop of Jerusalem, St. Cyril. Okay, now you've heard me joke about this before when I talked about some of the early fathers of the church. I mean, imagine having John the Apostle's signature on your baptismal certificate, right? So, so imagine having done OCIA with the Bishop of Jerusalem, St. Cyril, who if you don't know anything about him, I'll tell you a little bit about him today because he is really an interesting, an interesting figure of our faith. But he would literally, think about I said he's the bishop of where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So think about where these neophytes experienced their mystagogy. Literally, where Jesus taught, mm -hmm. suffered, mm -hmm. died, and probably just steps from the sepulcher um, mm -hmm. where he was buried and from which he rose. So quite an experience to have been, I'm sure, part of that mystagogy. I, I actually begin with this quote from him. This is from uh, St. Uh, St. Cyril, it's in one of the very first of his catechetical uh, talks, catechetical lectures. He left a lot of them. But he begins with this, and I, I think this is a beautiful quote. We deliver to you a mystery and the hope of life to come. That's the very first thing he has to say to someone who has come out of the waters of baptism. We deliver to you a mystery uh, and the hope of the life to come. So, I would, I would deliver, I would say I would deliver you a mystery. I can't say it as profoundly, of course, as St. Cyril did. But um, remember, we've talked about mystery in here before, the M word, the mystery, where we've, we've talked about sometimes it seems like um, we struggle with, with things that the church teaches, and we struggle to understand them, and sometimes the only answer the church gives us is what? It's just a mystery of our faith. Or it's a great mystery of our faith. And, and that which we do not understand, I think sometimes if we, if we approach it, rather than being frustrated with our lack of understanding, if we approach it with a certain kind of posture and an openness, I think when we confront the limits of our human knowledge, we know we're already in the presence of something greater than ourselves. And to, to acknowledge that is for actually for it to begin to open up for us. Uh, so, so I think that, that maybe we have to think about it a different, a different way. I've joked about it in here before and said, the church will say to you, oh, it's a great mystery, right? The Trinity, that's a great mystery. Yeah. Um, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, oh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great mystery. But, but I, this is not a cop-out to say um, there are great mysteries, and that's the point. The point is we reach the limits of our understanding and we, and we lean into something else. So, so that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about as well. So keep in mind, St. Cyril, who lived in the 4th century, to put him in some perspective, he was just a child when the Emperor Constantine built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. He was just a child when that was done uh, in Jerusalem. So he is delivering his teaching, his catechesis, um, probably literally within steps of the tomb, saying to these neophytes, we deliver to you a mystery. And you can imagine them standing there looking, perhaps, at Golgotha, or looking at, uh, at the tomb itself. So one of the other things that he noted, and I think this is important for all of us to hear this morning, is the, the duty of Christians, and he calls it a duty. He says the duty is that we share the mystery. We share it. He said, if there's no way that you can grow others in the faith that you do not know, you cannot share what you don't have to share. So, so I know that, um, and he, I'm not quoting, he says, no one can explain what they themselves do not understand. Okay, so most of you that are here, I know I'm preaching I'm preaching to the choir, I suppose, because you these are you're, you come every Sunday. You're here every Sunday. Most of you are familiar faces, um, but it's the reason we all are here. We want to know more. We want to go deeper. We want to explore the depths of these mysteries. And as we can see from Saint Cyril, this is timeless. This is, I mean, he's living in the fourth century, and his words are just as valid today as they were all those centuries ago. 
So I want to frame a little bit of this of this timeless aspect for us this way. Um, how many of you were at the 8 o'clock Mass? So you heard Father Rainey's um, homily where he talked about sort of the situation in the church today. He talked about the fact that people are leaving the faith in large numbers. That there, uh, What he didn't talk about, of course, is that there, the fact that there are a lot of Catholics who have expressed that they don't really believe in the real presence of Christ, something like 60 to 70 percent, which is a horribly alarming number. Um, to be fair, that number includes people who are not, um, who, are, who might identify as Catholic, but who are not necessarily practicing Catholics. So this is the reason we are in this great National Eucharistic Revival right now, is because the USCCB saw that data and went, oh my gosh, we have to do something to, to raise an awareness about what, what separates us as Catholics from the rest of Christianity is that Jesus is there fully, spiritually, materially, body and soul, blood and divinity in the, 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 the precious blood and in his body that we receive in, uh, in the Eucharist. And so that separates us. That's a big deal. You know, that is not, that's not a matter of, of just saying, well, you know, I can be like every other Christian out there because we can't. We have the gift of the Eucharist. And so um, I, I kind of wanted to frame that because when he brought it up this morning, I thought, I had that thought that I remembered the study that was done, I think it was 2019, where that data was, re was revealed and about the large numbers of people who are leaving the church. But I think we can also fall into the trap of thinking that somehow we are at a unique place in history, like this has never happened before, that there's never been a time of, uh, of confusion or division or uncertainty in the church. Really? Do we think that? It has never been before? And I, but I think that we can kind of think about our encounter with the world and the church as being somehow unique or exceptional. There's something different about the time that we are living in. And I can almost bet, and I say this as a historian, I can almost bet that every person who's lived in every age has had something like that. They felt something like that. That their own time was somehow unique. Um, we can think that we are facing greater challenges, for instance, than, than anybody who ever came before us because we live in this post-truth kind of society. Post-truth, post-Christian, post-whatever, right? St. Cyril put um, some of what he taught, though, uh, in such a way, in a context, that helps us understand that this is every age. This is the church in every age. Now, it might not be uniquely the situation that we have right now where we are facing uh, sort of a cultural... Uh, conflict, but there's always been, always been, in fact it's the very nature of the church itself, that there's always something that's going to, to be divisive, that's going to be um, counter to what is going on in the culture. The church has never been a force that integrates with culture. The church has always been a force that stands eternally against culture. It's human, but it's also divine. It also transcends history. So, so I think it's helpful to remember that, um, that no matter what's going on in the church, no matter what headline you read, no matter what bad news, gloom and doom you might hear on, on news or on social media, uh, the church has been here for um, over, well, two, right at 2,000 years, coming up on 2,000 years. And uh, I think it's safe to say that if humanity has not, um, if, if, I've heard it said this way, if this were a human institution, we wouldn't even be here this morning, right? If humans were in charge of this institution, we wouldn't be here this morning. It wouldn't have lasted. So I think it helps us to keep that, that perspective, too. Um, and be vigilant about continuing to bring the message, continuing to teach, continuing to learn what you can and what I can to bring the faith to other people. So um, these... Catechetical, 23, actually, of his catechesis survive. I would not recommend those for light reading. I mean, it's, I would suggest, if you're interested, they're available in full-text format online. You can go read them. Um, I didn't publish them for you, uh, but um, they're, let me just tell you this. Set aside a large chunk of time and copious amounts of coffee 
if, um, if that's what you want to do. Uh, maybe digest them a little bit at a time. The only ones that we think were really put down in writing in the early church are the ones that belong to, to St. Cyril. So think about those of you that went through, through OCI, and any of you at any point who went through OCI, remember that there is, there's a pretty rigorous um, and set uh, number of topics that must be covered, right? Who is God? Who is Jesus? Right? What is the church? The apostolic succession, the saints, uh, last things. I mean, all these topics really date to St. Cyril. So it's, it's his catechesis that have survived and continue to inform the way we do this. Um, but these are the only ones we have that, that have survived. Certainly, he could certainly teach the faith without the assistance of any books. I can tell you that. He absolutely, and when you read the catechesis, no. If you read the catechesis, you will know that immediately about him, that he could teach the faith without the assistance of, of anything, really. But we get a little glimpse of what it was like in the early church, and we get some insights into the prevailing concerns. This was my point. We get some insights into his concern about the culture because he almost says the same thing that we hear today, right? That the church must step up. The church must be there. We must know our faith. I mean, the message is seems to be the same in, in every age. And that is, of course, um, uh, a little icon of St. Cyril. So, so I love this. Something he says to those that he is teaching uh, from one of his catechesis. This is an instruction to people who are in the equivalent of OCIA. If you are ever sojourning in cities, inquire not simply where the Lord's house is, for the other sects of the profane also attempt to call their own dens houses of the Lord. <coughs> Y'all, this is before there's Protestants. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about variant sects of Christianity, those who might be teaching something heretical. He's probably also talking about pagans. But isn't that funny how he says it? For the other sects of the profane also attempt to call their own dens houses of the Lord. Okay? So he's very clear. Nor merely where the church is, but where is the Catholic church? So y'all, do you get the sense of this? He's writing this in the fourth century. And he's already concerned that there are groups out there that you don't need to be going to. Yes, there's Arians, right? Remember the Arian heresy. There's monophysites, those people that don't believe in the humanity of Christ. Um, there, I, there, I'm sure there's all these variant sects and, and probably pagans too, but he's very specific about this. For, the, for this is the peculiar name of this one holy church, the mother of us all. So the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church. Now a little bit about St. Cyril, and this is um, um, something I'm going to tell you, tell you briefly about. Cyril was caught up in some controversy, and again, this is not uncommon in the period that he's living in, but he was caught up in some controversy as he was trying to, to teach, and his, his primary mission was to teach those people coming into the faith and teaching neophytes. He was caught up in some controversy. He was accused by St. Jerome of being a heretic. Now, those of you that have been with me a little while, you know St. Jerome, right? St. Jerome is a difficult personality, uh, and I wouldn't want to be on the opposite side of him on almost anything, I don't think. But, but in, the, in the beginning, St. Jerome accused him of being a heretic, and he was ultimately vindicated. Uh, St. Jerome actually even apologized, which itself probably led to his canonization. <laughs> because he didn't apologize to anybody. So he ultimately ultimately did. The, the, the men were not reconciled, but I would say they were certainly at peace with each other. Uh, and um, he was, St. Cyril was eventually vindicated by the people, by the men of his own time, the own, his own age, and was made a doctor of the church uh, in the 19th century. It was Pope Leo XIII who made him a doctor of the church. Now, for those of you that don't know what that is, that means that he contributed something very significant to the faith. And this was it. I delivered to you a mystery. And the hope of the life of the world to come. The hope of the life to come. This is what his major contribution is, is to mystagogy, to the process of leading people into mystery. 
He was accused also, in addition to being accused of being a heretic, he was accused of selling church property. And he did. He did. The city of Jerusalem had suffered some drastic food shortages. Um, and there was some widespread famine. So Cyril secretly sold, and we have this from a primary source, I'm going to quote it. Cyril secretly sold sacramental ornaments of the church and a valuable holy robe, assuming a vestment, fashioned with gold thread that the Emperor Constantine had once donated for his bishop to wear when he performed the rite of baptism. But the source goes on to say, Cyril did this because people were starving. So, did he sell church property? Yes. Did he do it without permission? Probably. But it was not for personal profit. He fed the poor. So, so the, he, his life, I'm saying, is not marked, is not without being marked by controversy. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's another lesson in that, too, you know, that, that the lives of these people uh, that, um, who are models for us, the people who are saints, those models for us actually deserve or merit our study because they are people just like us. One of the things I have to tell you I took away from Adriana Akutis' visit with us, and I got to spend a good bit of time with her. You know, her nephew will be canonized as a saint. That's gotta be tough, having a saint in the family. I mean, that's gotta be tough. Um, but one of the things that I took away, well, a couple of things that, that I took away, and I don't, I don't think that she would mind me sharing this, is that there is something quite ordinary about <coughs> saints. The thing that is extraordinary is what they do, what they bring to others. It's the joy that he shared with others. It's the fact that every single time, and she, she made the, she, I don't think she told you guys this story. She told me the story that one of the, the, uh, the gifts that she gave for her mother last year was to go through all the photos that they had of, of Carlo, um, her grandson, went through all the photos and she organized them uh, into sort of making a, a booklet for her mother. And we're talking, she said, you know, like boxes of photographs. And um, that what she was so struck by is that in every single photograph, he had the same joyful expression, exactly the same, from the time he was a little bitty until he was a teenager. And, and, and she said, that's what he did is he brought joy. But he was an ordinary person. And he had ordinary challenges. Even as a teenager, he's kind of struggled with the same things that all teenagers struggle with. And so it occurs to me, even talking about people like St. Cyril, we think about the saints. We have to remember they are models for us, not because they did something necessarily extraordinary. It's the little things. It's the little things that really seem to make, to make the difference. So St. Cyril is a model for us because, yeah, he faced difficulty, but he remained steadfast in his faith um, throughout that. So his catechesis remain uh, pretty valuable examples uh, for us. And there was some reason I was going to mention this letter. Well, I oh, know it's in the letter to Constantinus, yeah. So there is an um, uh, interesting time going on in the 4th century. There is a kind of the end of what we would call in church history, we'd call it the ap uh, apocalyptic expectation. Remember that the early the disciples in the first generation of, of, of men after the apostles, they believed that Jesus' return was imminent, that he was coming back imminently. And so for the first few centuries, there's this expectant kind of, well, it's going to be today, it's going to be today, it's going to be today. And we, we call it the apocalyptic expectation. And Cyril is living in, in that time period, uh, even though we all know that Jesus didn't say what time, he didn't say what hour, he didn't say what year. He simply said, I'll return. Soon after his appointment as, as, uh, as bishop, he, he wrote this letter um, to Constantinus. Uh, it um, records the, um, the, the conversion of, of the... Um, 
for some people in his community that there was a cross of light in the sky above, above Golgotha, uh, which he had a vision of. It was also witnessed by many people who were there in Jerusalem. The Greek church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, actually commemorates this still on their calendars, May 7th, uh, this vision of St. Cyril. Uh, as, a, as a, Cyril took it as a sign of the second coming, okay, as reflected in his letters. But it also underscores his urgency in addressing neophytes because he includes this in his catechesis. He says, always be prepared. Always be prepared. The return of Christ is certain, he says. We do not know the day or the hour, but in the meantime, be busy spreading the news. Be busy spreading the news. That's, that's an English translation, of course. So how many of you noticed that we're here for uh, Adriana's presentation on the Divine Mercy image, the vision of, of, of St. Faustina? That original painting is her vision of Jesus. Does anybody remember anything about the posture of Jesus from that painting? His eyes were downcast. His eyes were downcast because he told St. Faustina, this is my, um, this is as I, I'm looking at you as, as was my gaze from the cross, right? So his eyes are down. But anybody notice anything about his feet? He's stepping towards us. He's stepping towards us. He is returning. <clears throat> He's returning. And so this was a, this is a constant. This is a, the truth of our faith. We wait expectantly. We don't look for signs. We don't try to read, you know, the, the, the signs of the times. We wait and we know we have faith that it will happen uh, because he said that it would. Okay. So his um, catechetical lectures I mentioned um, to be preparing for, for, um, for their sacraments. There are two parts for those who are about to receive the sacraments. And then once you receive the sacraments, there's a whole new set of instructions for you, for the neophytes. Um, the five final ones are actually called, he calls them the mystagogic the catechesis, or to lean in, to, lead, to be led into mystery. So again, it is a model that we still use, uh, even in the 21st century. We continue to be informed by what St. Cyril was doing in the 4th century, uh, how that mirrors what we've done, what you just went through in OCIA. Uh, he would have been very familiar with the order and the structure of that uh, since he wrote a lot of it. Uh, his writing is very clear. I say, I say it's a challenge to read. I think the challenge is for us in the 21st century is we are accustomed to reading fewer words. <laughs> Right? And sometimes uh, people of the past use more words than, than we are accustomed to having to read. And that would be what I would tell my students who would complain about some of the things I assigned for them. For instance, from the church fathers. Um, I often hear this. Well, couldn't they have said that in a couple of sentences? <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, his, his lectures are a model for us, and it's also frequently quoted in the catechism of the Catholic Church. The truths that are the foundation for him in the fourth century have not changed. Um, we might come to understand things in a different light, a new light, or we can mature in our ability to express what we believe in the culture that we occupy, uh, but he makes it clear that the teaching that we received was from the apostles. It is bloodstained and therefore it is not subject to change. It's not something that we can, we can change, even as new questions and new controversies come about. So, um, I dare say that if, if, if I were to have said, okay guys, I want y'all to go read and read the mystagogic catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, everybody would come back, back in here, if you came back next week, you might not come back next week. <laughs> but if you came back next week, uh, I think you would, you would say, you know what, I'm a neophyte too. <laughs> I'm a neophyte too, because I really don't understand this. So how well do we really understand our Catholic faith? Um, what the church teaches us about sacramental grace? Do we go to confession? How often do we go to confession? How often do we go to mass? Yes, you have your Sunday obligation. Um, I'm not suggesting that, um, that 
that everybody can have the devotion of more frequent mass than, than Sunday mass, which is, of course, required of us. It's a precept of the church. But I will say that a frequent reception of the, of, the, uh, of the sacraments, if you have the understanding that God's grace flows through those sacraments, then the more frequently you can receive those sacraments, the more grace you're going to have. And, and do we understand that in a way that we can express and share with others? I think that's another thing. To quote St. Cyril again, we deliver to you a mystery and the hope of life to come. So, mystagogy. Mystagogy. Grace. I shared my return with some of you. Some of you have heard this story, some of you have not. So if you've heard the story, you can tune out, you can go get coffee, you can leave, whatever. But I have shared with you, with some of you, my own story. Um, I don't know that our neophytes have heard this. Um, about my own return to Catholicism, which is now um, 10 years ago. How time flies. Wow, 10 years ago. My own return, uh, and I know that some of you, that some of you might have, I've actually wrote a book about it called Round Trip to Rome. And because I came to the faith as a young, uh, a young woman and returned, actually left the church for another tradition, the Protestant tradition, came back, uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, but I tell, I tell the story of the book of my coming to the church as a teenager, my departure some years later into Protestantism, and my joyous return in 2014. So yeah, it's been 10 years. But today I want to talk a, a little more about my own early experience with this concept of mystagogy to take to take sort of the, um, maybe the intangible and the, um, you know, the more, the more heady stuff of St. Cyril, that intangible and maybe bring it down to a personal level to share with you a little bit about my own journey back and, uh, and, and, and more importantly, my own experience with mystagogy when I came into the church at the age of 18. I was very young, 18 is young, Looking at the, that's very young, um, but I was uh, I was unchurched uh, as a child, and really had no concept of, of of God. God was something that was big. I knew that something that um, that that must have created everything and governed everything, and but it was it was a very nebulous concept to me as a child. You know, you think about. I can remember sometimes having um, a prayer that was taught to me to say at bedtime, but that's really the only expression of faith that was in my house growing up. And never, we never attended church. I went to a Methodist, <laughs> went to a Methodist uh, vacation Bible school one summer, which was fun. And I still have the little wood burning project I made that year. God is love, right? This, that was the little wood burning project that I had, uh, still have it. And, but that was my experience. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I knew nothing. But when I was 10 years old, there was a large Catholic family across the street. And when I tell you they were a good Catholic family, <laughs> I think they had 10 children. And one of them became a, a good friend of mine as a child, and she invited me to go to Mass with the family one Sunday. And I was 10. I knew nothing about the church. But I can tell you today, <clears throat> I can stand here today and describe, almost describe in vivid detail to you everything I experienced that day at 10 years of age, including the artworks that were in that church. And I remember looking up <clears throat> the crucifix and knowing that it must mean something. And this woman holding this baby very tenderly in her arms in this statue that I knew had to mean something. And all I knew was that this was a mystery to me because I didn't know it, but I had the oddest, strangest, most childlike tug on my heart to know more. So between the age of 10 and 18, I frequently would, um, would attend mass with this family um, came, became a little more comfortable and knowledgeable about the Mass itself. But I didn't still, and this was immediate, like post-Vatican II, by the way. So the family was upset. I remember the family being upset. 
uh, that things were different, but I didn't really understand that. All I knew is that there was a great peace in that. And, and at some other time, I mean, I could, I could be more personal about it, but there was, that was a very safe space for me to be. And that's really all I knew at the time. It felt good to be there. So at the age of uh, about 15 or 16, I inquired uh, of my mother. My, my father had already passed away. And I inquired of my mother if I could begin attending classes uh, at this church. And she told me no. Uh, and I inquired about being baptized. And she told me no. So um, my very first adult act of rebellion when I turned 18 was to enroll in catechesis um, with a Dominican priest, a delightful Dominican uh, by the name of Father Bill Updegraff, God rest his soul. He is now in the glorious company of the saints himself. But this was a period, and actually when I look back at this now, this is an incredible story, because Bill Updegraff was in the Diocese of Shreveport for about 14 months only. He was a Dominican. So he didn't belong, he was not a diocesan priest. He was a Dominican and he was here for a very specific period of time. And it just so happened to coincide with the year that he spent with me. And so I always like to think that God sent him here just for me, <laughs> okay, just for me. But Father Bill, um, uh, looking back on all of this now, um, and it was a year, we would meet every Friday afternoon in his office, he was at St. Mary the Pines. And we would meet every Friday afternoon. Uh, this was before the, main, the new main church was built. And, uh, and he, he spent an hour, or maybe sometimes a little more, every Friday afternoon. And looking back on it, I knew, I, I'm aware now, there were other people who came into the church. It wasn't just me, right? There were other people who came into the church that Easter but for some reason, I don't remember being part of a group. I remember him spending private time with me, and maybe it's because he thought this poor girl knows nothing, you know, uh, and maybe that's why. But um, maybe I was just on a particularly, I, I might have been a high-maintenance catechumen, and he just thought, oh, Lord, this girl needs special help. That, that probably could have been it. It was a little bit non-traditional, but his approach was based in a very Dominican spirituality, uh, his approach to teaching and, and understanding God. And it really very much shaped and formed who I am uh, as a Christian, I think even, even now I teach, more than any other one influence uh, he, had on, he had this on me. He would begin every week's meeting with this question. I mean, I would come in and sit down. He knew that I was a bird lover. Now, those of you who know me well, know that I'm kind of a bird nerd. And he had this massive Audubon, this beautiful Audubon illustrated book. And it was always open on, a, on a, uh, a table in his office. And sometimes it was open to a different, you know, different bird. And he would begin every week's meeting with a question, you know, this, this was the question. How have you encountered God in the world this past week? Okay, I'm 18, right? Okay, think about all the things that 18-year-olds do. I'm 18. He would always begin that way. And remember that the most famous Dominican was not St. Dominic, right? Who's the most famous Dominican? Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, St. Thomas Aquinas. For whom the purest evidence of God is found in nature. It's in the natural order. Right? So the first time he asked me that, I can remember, it kind of vaguely now, but I can remember probably shrugging and saying, I don't know what, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, um, I went to school, you know, I got in my car, went out with some friends, I mean, went to a movie, whatever. Um, and so he would prompt me with simple things. He would say things like, well, did you see a sunrise? Does any 18-year-old see a sunrise? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, because our, yes, our generation could stay out until 6 a.m., right? Go to work, 
wearing of the hand stamp we got at the club the night before. You probably haven't changed clothes, right? But, um, but I mean, seriously, I, I can remember thinking, okay, whatever, sunrise. Did you notice anything in nature that moved you? Um, and as weeks would go by, questions got a little more challenging. Did you hear some random encouraging words from a stranger? Did you have any encounters with people that you didn't that you never met before? Um, what was that what was that encounter like? What was that exchange like? Um, when you pray, what do you feel? Not what do you say, what do you feel? Which I've always found to be an interesting an interesting question. He taught me though that we encounter God in every moment, and I think that's what the message always was. We encounter him in every moment everywhere, but when we give and receive love, we have made contact, like direct contact, in relationships. So as we went on, we focused more and more on the relationships I had with people and friends and the, the exchanges I had with people in the world. And you see, he's leading me on a journey. From the birds <laughs> to the sunrises I never saw to, to, to experiences with people and, and I can remember vividly that um, this process, as I said, took a year. And it was only like in the middle of this that we really began to explore this is the church. This is what the church teaches. This is who the apostles are. This is what, you know, the church teaches about the sacraments. It was only after he led me through the mystery of God's remarkable creation and his order for my life and to understand that God is love that he ever <coughs> introduced the church to me. Right. Which I think is sort of, again, I don't know that that's necessarily the model that St. Cyril would have approved of, but it was certainly a model that, that worked for me in, in that particular uh, situation. He would prompt me to explore things like if there was ever a time that um, that I had received an unexpected gift. Have you ever had this happen to you? Like just out of the blue one day somebody gives you something or, or, or maybe reaches out to you by text or phone call with just a word of encouragement? Um, were there times that I had felt the love and kindness of a stranger? You know, that person who who steps in and does something for you quite unexpectedly and you don't even know this person. Um, so not something you can hold in your hand, but the gift of someone's time. These were all things that he introduced to me as God. These were encounters with God. Anything that is beautiful and affirming and anything that causes us to wrestle and reflect and challenge is God. And so I came to, to sort of understand that. But you see, I knew the next week he was going to ask me this question. So I better have something ready to say. It was going to ask the first thing. And I learned that I better have an answer because the lesson um, on the Trinity, the sacraments, the saints, liturgy, holiness, whatever, was going to be the topic that week. It wouldn't begin until I answered the question, how did you encounter God in the world this week? So... We discussed Cheryl's divine encounters before we ever got to the lesson. And little did I know that that was, in fact, the major part of the lesson. So in seeking to answer that inevitable weekly question, I began to naturally do what? I paid attention. <laughs> Father Bill's going to ask me at 3 o'clock on Friday. I better have an answer. So, so I began to be attentive to, to the world around me. I began to take notice, to open my eyes to the mystery that is in the ordinary. The ordinary. A bird in flight, for instance. Okay, for those of you who don't know a bird nerd, now you might know why. Um, wildflowers in bloom, trees, skies, clouds, thunderstorms. I do love thunderstorms. All things that, that cause us to pause and notice if we just let them. But he was intentionally directing me to do that. Otherwise, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have. But today, I do it instinctively because it was so much a part of my formation as a Christian, as a Catholic Christian. And this is to the great annoyance of others, no doubt. I mean, I'm sure it is because I, I am a hopeless bird nerd. Don't ride in the car with me anytime in the springtime because there's always going to be a roadside stop to pick wildflowers. Always. Um, 
I do, I do break for wildflower picking. Uh, the state police know me now, so it's okay. Um, I cloud watch, I stargaze, I can lose hours in the woods. But you know, it is the ordinary. It's the ordinary. So fast forward, after I was baptized, uh, received my first Holy Communion, and confirmed uh, on the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation, I immersed myself into the rhythm of the church. Not really having consciously made a connection, immediate, I don't think immediately I made this connection, but there had been a rhythm to the, to the weekly sessions where I was immersing myself in God's natural world and the natural creation and everything around me. Then I immersed myself into the rhythm of the church and the two are so seamless to me now because of that. Completely seamless. Um, my formation. So several weeks afterwards, after my mystagogy, my mystagogy actually consisted of continuing to have meetings. This time it was more, we would talk about birds, to be honest. My mystagogy was talking about birds. We would, we would talk about the sacraments in the end, and uh, I remember meeting immediately after the Feast of the Annunciation and having to talk about that. But um, we would always, he would always flip when he, when I go in, he'd always flip the page. You know, we talk about a different bird or something I had seen. And there's a whole story surrounding that. You've got to read the book to get that story. But several weeks afterwards, he stopped me after Mass one day and said, you know, um, please come see me. I have something that I want, I want to chat with you about. And rather than asking me in that session, have, how have you encountered the divine? He had a new question. This is where I, I really see the... the the seamlessness of this. He said, how have you encountered Christ in the sacraments? So before, the question was, how have you encountered God in the world, in the ordinary? And now the question is, how have you encountered Christ in the sacraments, which is the extraordinary? You see? So do you understand that the process of becoming a Catholic Christian for me was to move from the ordinary into the extraordinary? but to see them as the same. The question was different, he told me, because you are now different. You are no longer an inquirer or a catechumen whose divine experiences are limited to the ordinary. You are now a full member of Christ's own body dwelling in the extraordinary. And he gave me some marching orders. You've been called, he said, and now you will be sent. And boy, have I ever been sent. Mm -hmm. He told me my call to conversion, he was certain, did not stop at my baptism. <laughs> okay, I would be equipped for mission, that I had been given some gift at my baptism and at my confirmation <coughs> that I was to carry into the church and into the world. Um, but that I must lean fully and completely into this extraordinary mystery by opening my heart just as I had opened my eyes to the world, I would open my heart to the church. Do you see what a gift this man was in my life? And I'm telling you, he was here for 14 months. He came just for me, but just for me. But he deliberately used the word, or I thought he had used the word lean. Lean into mystery. So when I heard that Mr. Goji meant lead into mystery, I thought I had lost something in translation. I am 100% certain that I said at that point, I don't have a clue what you're talking about, but okay. So he went on to tell me, yes, you do. These past months, you have encountered the divine everywhere. I know because you told me. You came in here every week and you told me about it. The, ne the, the next thing that sort of imprinted in my brain in a way that I didn't even realize until recently how much, he said, now meet him face to face in the sacraments. That was the Father Bill version of mystagogy. And I'm not going to lie, it was a bit of a disappointment um, in grad school in a patristics class once <clears throat> when I realized that he had lifted that line from St. Ambrose of Milan, that that was not an original. 
meet Christ face to face in the in the sacraments. It was also not an original that you've experienced the divine in the world now or the ordinary in the world now experience the extraordinary in the church. That was also not an original. I was a little bit disappointed. But no matter what, um, this is where all of you who are neophytes are right now. You're at this nexus of having made this transition into the extraordinary life, sacramental life of the church. Uh, two weeks ago, you experienced the divine among the ordinary, and now you too dwell in the extraordinary mysteries uh, of, of the extraordinary faith, the fullness of the truth. So, the Catechism tells us this, quote, the sacraments are instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church a bit of which divine life is dispensed to us, or by, by a bit of which divine life is dispensed to us. Mysteriously, they deepen our joy, they heal us, and at the center of all the sacraments is, of course, the Holy Eucharist. So it recently uh, clicked with me, and I don't remember when I heard this, it was reading from the Gospel of Luke um, um, that really clicked with me about this. Um, and I, and I know that, from my own experience, the only thing I can tell you is that not everybody can go to daily Mass. Um, I mean, it is a devotion. It's not something that one must do. It's a devotion, should you choose to. But I cannot commend enough uh, frequent reception of the Eucharist and frequent confession um, because, you know, I've heard it said, I mean, no, not because you're going to become more holy, I wish that were true. <laughs> it's not because you're going to become more holy. But you will receive more graces. And graces make this journey easier, but they also point us to a more eternal perspective. One of the things that I share with people uh, about, uh, about when, I, when I sort of devote myself to frequent reception of the Eucharist, is I notice that my perspective becomes more eternal and not quite so fixed on the temporal, the right now. But my focus gradually becomes more eternal. And it's not me. That's not me doing that. Um, it's not because I'm becoming more holy. It cer that certainly hasn't happened to me. But something does happen is that, that we receive that grace to, to contemplate him more eternally. So I know that for me, being frequently in his presence... Um, that is one of, one of the graces for me. I am better able to love. Um, I am better able to, to, to carry out my life's work, um, which is to teach and to be among students of all kinds, but uh, nowhere approaching perfect. There is a hymn that we used, we used to sing in the Episcopal Church. That was the Protestant tradition I left for. That's a whole other story. I'm not gonna tell you today. There's a hymn we used to sing that I've actually thought about far more since I've returned to the Catholic Church. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that was the great lesson of my mystagogy, was moving from the things of the world to contemplating his face. So, grace, you know, the free gift. And it's so true that the things of the world are dimmed when you meet him face to face. So, the guide for confession. How often, do you, or how often does the church say you have to go to confession? I'm going to put my neophytes on the spot. How often must you go to confession? Once a year. Okay. I don't know how anybody does that. <laughs> I'm just... I don't know anybody does that. Uh, they're leading an extraordinary life is the only thing I can say. But there's no reason to be a minimalist. I mean, it's like the precept of the church is that you attend Mass on Sunday. But again, why, why is there a need to be a minimalist about that? I mean, for the same reason, grace is a free gift. You don't, there's no point at which you have to say, oh, I have too much grace. Um, we were all created for another world. I mean, I think that's the big message, an eternal one in that light which is inaccessible to us right now, but will not always be. And that is the extraordinary mystery. That's the mystery. Where all of this ultimately leads is to eternal life. So I'm going to paraphrase Father Bill when I say this. Mystagogy means to, be, to lead into mystery, but I would challenge you to think of it as leaning, leaning, like a physical posture, 
lean into the mystery with your heart wide open to see him face to face and trust him that you're not going to fall. Lean in. So, all right, I will stop right there. Um, uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet is, you know, is this afternoon. Uh, it's a very special devotion um, that the church has on this second Sunday. It used to just be the second Sunday of Easter, uh, but thanks to Pope St. John Paul II, it is Divine Mercy Sunday. So uh, that, that's going on this afternoon. Um, that goes back to the 1930s. A Polish nun by the name of St. Faustina Kowalska who received that vision of his mercy. So, um, yeah, try to do that if you can. All right, I'm going to stop the video. Anybody have any questions or comments of any kind?